Steve Harshman. Welcome to Star Tribune. Yeah, thanks. Uh, take this chance to introduce yourself and, and say, uh, say why you're on it. Sure. Uh, my name is Steve Harshman. I have uh, was born in Casper when uh, I was from the Toronto County Memorial Hospital. And, and uh, I was raised in Midwest, graduated Midwest High School. And, and uh, so I've been a resident really of Natrona County all my 51 years, except for a few years when I went to college and graduate school and kind of circled back when my first daughter was born to um, basically so my kids would grow up knowing their grandparents. And um, so this uh, job at Natrona County High School opened and I was really fortunate to get it back in 91 and been there ever since. And so we raised our four kids here, my wife Becky and I, and, and uh, I've always been kind of involved and and uh, interested obviously in government and and um, and it was just an opportunity to serve when Rick Tempest a former speaker in my district stepped down and and uh, so I threw my hat in the ring and uh, was fortunate and so you know I've continued to run for re-election I think uh, you know it's obviously important work but I think more than anything I really you know I appreciate the opportunity to serve and uh, it's a it's a tremendous institution and I I uh, so I've tried to work hard and just you know, use my time there as 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 to beneficial as possible to get things done. Great, thanks. What what would you consider the biggest problem the legislature should address in the upcoming session? Well, I you know there'll, there'll be probably I don't know five six hundred bills in the house. Um, I think um, you know there's going to be work on probably a whole myriad of things, but really the issues that we'll face today are going to be the same issues that were probably a hundred years ago. I think education is going to be one of the top topics. Uh, I think uh, minerals and water, um, transportation is always going to be big, and uh, so those things are always going to be in front of us. You know, uh, crime and justice are always huge, and uh, then I think you know the supplemental budget. And, and frankly, when I was a a new legislator, I ran a lot of bills. One year, I think I ran 20 bills. And as chairman of appropriations now, I've, I have to kind of run the biggest bill, the budget bill. And so we'll have a supplemental budget. We're hoping that the, the requests are quite modest, uh, but there will be probably a few adjustments to the budget I'd anticipate. There always is, but, uh, uh, you know, so that'll be the focus of my work. And then the committees that I serve on, uh, if reelected, are you know, school uh, facilities, and then the Educational Accountability Committee. And, and we're just kind of coming to a head, finally, on that committee, and I think we're ready to start moving forward. So, um, and I have a few constituent bills that are small bills that folks have brought to me, but and really most of the ideas that legislators have are uh, when their constituents contact them. I don't think anybody lays awake night thinking of small bills or this bill or that bill. There are usually problems out there that people have. They contact their legislator and they try to run it through. And um, so I think all those issues will be out there. We'll, in the end, we'll, it'll be thousands of votes cast by each legislator and committee and first, second, and third readings of bills. And so uh, it'll be a lot of work and it's pretty fast and furious. School districts are pounding the drum for a cost of living adjustment, or some school districts are anyway. Is the, uh, are we at the right place in school funding? Why or why not? Well, it's a there's it's probably not a one minute answer, but we're pretty close, I think. And and I've been involved with that really since my early days. And and when we recalibrated and gone with this new consultant model in 2005, uh, we granted cost of living indexes, I think, in six, seven, and eight and really got out ahead of inflation. And we have a more refined index now that looks at uh, really teacher salaries, classified salaries, and then the costs of uh, materials in schools. And we're pretty close. And I think uh, we're going to, but we want to hear all sides of the issue on that. Uh, I don't think we're dramatically underfunding it. I think, uh, and there's another part of the story is we have what was called the consultants model, and then what is really in effect in Wyoming is the legislative model, which in 2005 we, you know, I think the consultant model was 17 to 1 K through 3 class sizes. Well, we went 16 to 1 K through 6, millions of dollars, you know, 20, 25 million dollars a year statewide. Um, as far as small school adjustments, we enriched that to ensure that every small school is resourced with a full-time principal and, and certain numbers of core uh, teachers in every area those things add up and we so our legislative model is about 90 million more than the consultant model uh, to be constitutional and so I think there's this 
constant debate. Some legislators say, hey, we're, we're overfunding education by 90 million. And I, I disagree with that. I think we've chosen a legislative model. Now, if we choose at some point to say, you know, we probably enriched it too much and we want to go back to the consultant model. I don't think you starve school districts down by, I think we have that conversation and say, at this point in time, we will move to the consultant model. We can't afford it anymore, whatever the conversation is. And, uh, but I think it's a way you got to allow 48 school districts to operate and, and uh, do business in the right way. And, and uh, so I think, uh, I think we're in a pretty good place, but I tell you, we're going to, like we always do, we're going to have open hearings, we're going to listen to both sides, and we're going to get the best information we can to try to make the best decision we can. Should the uh, Medicaid expansion is a pretty hot topic that comes up a lot, and, and should Wyoming allow for Medicaid expansion? If not, what would you do to avoid shifting costs from uncovered poor patients onto paying patients? Yeah, and I tell you, it's a tough, a tough deal. And I think here's where it's really at. And uh, uh, we would have to appropriate about 800 million in federal dollars to save about 50 million in state. I mean, that's the fact of it. So when you, but what you said is exactly right. And if we we haven't done that, we've chosen not to do that because uh, it just seems odd that how could the federal government continue to support that? And they haven't done it. And uh, the Medicaid match, it's gone from a 60-40 to a 50-50 just in my time in the legislature. They haven't done it with federal mineral royalties. That's gone from a 50-50 to now a 52-48, taking AML dollars away from our state. We're the largest um, uh, mine tax, coal uh, tax paying state in the country. And uh, so you see all those signs and it's worrisome that uh, we could get into this deal, and then it's no longer a 90-10 proposition, which the federal law is, and it starts changing to an 80-20, a 70-30, and where do we go in Wyoming? And now, but what you said about the cost shifting is real, and particularly with our hospital in Natrona County. It's probably the greatest example of that because it's a trauma center in the middle of the state, and that's one issue. So trauma patients, particularly those who don't have insurance are quickly sent to our city. Um, we have multiple hospitals now in Casper. Um, we know by our law and our county commissioners, part of the county, they're going to take all patients. And so our county hospital, our Wyoming Medical Center, is, is in a tough spot. Uh, we're working on that. I think there's, there's other options than a full acceptance of the expansion. There's other states that have um, experimented. Utah has currently uh, got a plan, I think, that many of us are looking at. But uh, I think it's going to be an ongoing issue. And I, um, uh, the one thing that really obviously is, I think, tough for our city is particularly the Wyoming Medical Center. And I'd uh, like to find a, a, a solution for that. But I would say the legislature can't solve all problems either. And we just can't. And uh, but I think we're going to continue to look at it and monitor it and and uh, still debate it. What would you propose to solve what uh, one legislator, I think it was Hank Coe, uh, called decades-long turmoil between the legislature, the State Board of Education, and the Department of Education? Yeah, it's a, I think... Um, I think if you... Just in my time in the legislature, we've had... Uh, uh, our three superintendents, one resigned, another was appointed, and now one is a one term uh, that has been a lot of controversy. And I think particularly recently with No Child Left Behind and now all states are in these testing modes and we design our own tests, set our own standards, and then we look and we say, well, we don't have as many proficient kids as Mississippi. And the fact is that you can't compare anybody to anything and because everybody has their own tests and sets their own standards and their own uh, levels of proficiency. So what we've had is this, you know, back in 2002, candidate ran against the test. We had what was called the YCAS test. It was changed the pause test, cost, cost, cost millions of dollars. Uh, the previous superintendent we had an online version crashed, and that became an election issue. We go on, we now have a new vendor for pause. It's changed multiple times, millions and millions of dollars. It's a very expensive test, and uh, we're in this, uh, we're kind of in this zone now where we're with no child left behind and how it's going to all work out, and frankly, I think we're all getting tired of it. And so it's become a 
thing where a candidate runs against the test, runs against some issues, has an initiative, costs the state millions of dollars, and then you have a department that's supposed to be steady and has professionals that have been there for years and years become experts in their area to provide information to the executive and legislative branches, uh, now under new leadership all the time and new kind of political leadership. And uh, there's not many states do it like we do. There's only about eight states left that even elect a, a superintendent, and many of those don't run the departments. They're more of a figurehead. And uh, so I've long s said that uh, whether it's electing a state board or we do something a little different, but I think uh, we have no other situation like this in state government. I mean, we took the Department of Audit away from the auditor years ago, the state auditor. And uh, so I think... Uh, I think it's set up for a little bit of turmoil, frankly, in a political office. And then, and then since the most recent Supreme Court cases from Washkie to the Campbell decisions has clearly said the legislator, legislature, uh, it's our number one duty is K-12 education in this state. And they've, they've said that we have not only, um, you know, the, the, uh, the authority, but really the uh, duty to make sure the system does not fail. And that's the words from Campbell, that the system does not fail. So it's really, I think, our number one issue in the legislature. I think it's going to continue to be. And, um, but I hope now we can, I hope we can move past some of this. And uh, I don't know, you know, so, but I think the, the system is inherently set up for conflict. So the legislation that you've seen, uh, so let's say like recently, the last couple of years, what would you consider the biggest waste of the legislature's time? That's a good question. I, I you know, I think, uh, you know, it's our processes. We're elected representatives of the people, and I think to, uh, when people bring bills, they're usually important to that legislator or somebody, and I think, uh, I think waste of time is a disrespectful kind of way to no, I hope some of the bills that I've had that failed weren't considered a waste of time. I think, and in, in eventually, they've done some good. You know, I failed at the Hathaway Scholarship the first time, failed at full day kindergarten the first time, and I think some of those things are going to make a real difference. And and uh, so I think uh, I don't know how to answer that really. I think you know, yeah, have we done the state cookie and the state mythical creature and all those things, sure. But most of those are run for school children. Uh, a fourth grade class from some community in Wyoming to really learn the process. And uh, so, uh, so I don't know. I guess I'm not going to take that question and just jump on that and give you three or four things because I just don't think this thing is disrespectful to the members and really to the institution because I think they're important and that's their prerogative as an elected representative. So, Jerry, let me jump in. So, let me ask it a different way then. So, we, we don't have to frame it up as a waste of time, but Maybe what's one thing that the legislature's done over the last couple of years that, that has made it all the way through and that you've had a strong disagreement with the final outcome? Maybe that's a better way to, to ask that question. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can even. I get over it pretty quick. <laughs> Gosh, I don't know if I could name one bill, you know. I think uh, we've done a lot of work on uh, impaired driving. I think we're going we're gonna to continue to do more. Uh, we have currently have the system where if you refuse a test, you can literally be strapped down and blood taken from you. Uh, that's a close call. Still the United States of America, and when you can be strapped down in the sheriff's office and blood taken from you, that's close. And I think all of us have kind of voted for that, and you kind of... And then the flip side of that is, well, how are we going to get to these serial guys who just refuse to take the test? And... Uh, so it's not an easy answer, and those, you know, so that's a thing that you think about. Is that the right thing? I don't know, uh, but it's currently the law. Thank you, Kirk. So we talked a little bit about uh, education turmoil, uh, and this might be part of this, or potentially a solution. Should the superintendent of public instruction, uh, or the head of the Department of Education, depending on you want to look at this, be elected or appointed? Well, and yeah, kind of going back, I think you have to have, people have to have a voice in it, and I think many states have a you know, an elected school board and a uh, state board. Ours is appointed and uh, that sets standards. You know, our Constitution pro prohibits the legislature or the executive from prescribing textbooks and really do going into curriculum. 
Uh, and so our, it's our local 48 school districts make all those decisions. What ta what's taught, when it's taught, and who teaches it, you know, and that's where the rubber really hits the road on it. But uh, you go to states like Texas, I mean, it's a big deal. They pick the textbook for the state, and uh, I don't think that's the, the way of why. I mean, I think we all value local control in our school districts, but uh, perhaps there is another way to – Obviously, people have to have a voice in it. They do through their local elected school boards, but maybe the election of a state board and uh, that maybe appoints a superintendent for an alternating term. I mean, there's lots of ways. There's lots of models out there that other states do it uh, that would still give people the right to vote on this issue, but maybe give more continuity to a professional department. I mean, we don't elect a Department of Health director or, you know, every department in state government. So... Speaking of curriculum, though, let's talk about the next generation science standards. So that certainly came through from the legislative decision, or, or it was kind of barred from, from being uh, being something that, that could be used or talked about from the State Board of Education. Where, where are you at in the next generation science? Standards? Yeah, I think um, it's unfortunate that came in the budget, but that is the process. I mean, it's majority rule, and you can make an amendment to that. And was uh, prohibiting the expenditure of money uh, to adopt those, and. Uh, you know, I don't, uh, I think it was 2011, our current superintendent and everybody was in favor of Common Core. And they said, our, I remember our, uh, it was in a meeting here in Casper in the summer of 2011 um, with our select accountability meeting. And I asked a lot of questions. Why would we adopt a new set of Common Core standards? We just changed the pause test and now we're going to be changing it again in a couple of years and then we'll be rolling to another test the way it's described to us. And so I actually made the motion to hold off Common Core for a year. Let's look at it for a year and make sure it's right. It was, it took a little time. It was implemented and adopted by the state board. I think the same thing is true with the next generation science standards. I don't, I don't think it does any harm for people to have a little more time to look at it. I don't think it's going to, it's a, you know, it's not an emergency situation where we have to adopt these last spring. I think you give people a little more time, feel uh, that people have more input, and whatever's decided, then we'll have the best standards for our kids. So describe what Wyoming's economy should look like in 20 years, and, and what would you as a legislator propose to get us there? Well, I think uh, Wyoming is certainly obviously blessed with our minerals. I mean, it's, it's the driver of our state. It's really the driver of most of the service jobs in this state. And uh, so it's going to continue to be. I mean, we have 500 years of coal in our state. And uh, we have more uranium than anybody in the United States. Our oil, I think, is we're just figuring out where we have more oil. And uh, so I think we're going to still be an energy economy. But I think uh, we're moving in a direction. And instead of being a total exporting energy colony when you have it to really a, a value added and you know we're going to see a ammonia plant in Sweetwater County huge deal and and uh, so I uh, serve on this value added select committee that's the whole idea a lot of my initiatives in the budget the last five six years have been about natural gas and and uh, coal exports and about value added uh, it was my uh, amendment in the budget on the on the X prize, uh, on the carbon capture. And so all these initiatives, this is a real keen area of interest of mine that I've worked hard on. Uh, I don't think uh, any of us want Wyoming to be, I certainly don't like the front range of Colorado and uh, we have, you know, uh, belts around belts to get to, uh, get to work every day. Uh, but I do think we can, we can add value to our minerals and, um, I think this is all kind of coming. We're, we're starting to see the transmission capacity coming to Wyoming for uh, wind power. I don't know whether wind power is going to provide all that or not, but we're going to have the transmission lines here. And uh, all this is coming to a head, and I think it's been a lot of work over the last decade by a lot of people. And I, uh, So I think that's where we're going to be in 20 years. I think we're going to see steady growth, um, growth probably on our terms, certainly energy related, but I think if we can diversify more, uh, particularly value added, it's going to be great for our, our kids and, and our uh, citizens. It'll be great jobs. The state has significant reserves in case of a rainy day. What do you use a rainy day? Uh, if, if you had to spend money from those reserves, where would you spend it? 
Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think um, uh, we're getting close. I think uh, it's going to tip to about oh, nearly two billion dollars in in what are um, savings that uh, and that can be withdrawn quickly. Obviously, our permanent savings, which are endowed to the state, and we receive the income off those forever. We're talking about basically savings that don't draw much interest, which is problematic. And we have a bill, I think, to start trying to invest some of that, allowing the people to vote on that and be a vote of the people to decide that constitutional amendment. But back to your deal, I think um, um, we've been really fortunate the last decade. You know, in the 90s, we were pulling, we have really two sides of the budget, the school foundation side and the general fund side. And we pulled money from general fund to to fund education. We haven't had to do that, you know, in over a decade. I think the a rainy day is when we start having to pull from the general side to fund the education side. And uh, uh, and I tell you, looking at our forecast, it's probably not that far off. I think we're going to be good for the remainder of this biennium and probably into fiscal year 17. Uh, but it starts to get a little tighter you know, on the fiscal year 18. And the biggest dry up in that is coal lease bonuses. And not that we're not mining coal, it's first of all, we had a surplus, we had a couple mild winters, we had a huge surpluses stockpiled at power plants all across the country, and then um, put a little price pressure on and people slowed down mining. That's kind of reversed itself a little bit, but a lot of these are long-term contracts. And uh, so, you know, that'll pick back up again, but uh, we're going to continue to mine coal for many, many decades. But um, so that's the biggest kind of downturn in our revenue that's coming forward. So what do you consider? I mean, you said you haven't met him, but if you had to define the difference between you and your opponent, how would you, how would you do that? You know, I haven't met my opponent. <clears throat> I don't know where he stands on any issues. I'm sure he's a nice fellow, and I've heard that he's real and a real support of the Second Amendment. I've just heard that. I don't even know. Uh, I've been endorsed by the NRA as a as a uh, as their candidate. I think every election now, and uh, since I've served in the legislature, uh, I've been hunting like crazy the last two weeks. I think uh, you know that's a big part of our our state and a huge part that'll continue to be. And uh, so I don't know our differences. I just think you know. Uh, as a Wyoming kid, I think I've got a sense of of, uh, of Wyoming, our history, and where we're going to go, and a and, uh, real love for Wyoming. I mean, uh, so that's where I'm coming from, and I just want to preserve that really for our kids. I mean, that's what we want. Shoot, we, we want our kids to be able to come back here and work and stay here, and, and uh, but not, not to be... Uh, like Utah is getting out of the box a little bit, and and certainly Colorado, and to just grow like that, I don't think that that's in our interest. Any other questions? <clears throat> well, let me give you a couple minutes and make a closing statement, and uh, tell us tell us why we should vote for you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. I think uh, I think as much as anything, I'll continue to work hard. I mean, I I don't know. I'm there's a lot of people that do whatever. I think the the big thing I try to work hard at. I try to work hard at it, at it, whatever I've done. And I think uh, um, so. I'm gonna, you know, I've always been open and listen or whatever. People can call me. My cell phone's out there. It's it's on the legislative website. And I feel a lot of calls and emails, those kind of things. So, um, but I think I just have a good sense of Wyoming common sense. Do, am I gonna agree with folks every time? No. I never supported the lottery. A lot of people beat me up, won the lottery. I never supported it. We're going to disagree on things, but as a general kind of um, conservative uh, fiscal budget planning and just kind of looking out for the long term, I think, you know, I've got that view of Wyoming, and uh, I'll keep that. So, and again, I just really appreciate the opportunity to serve, and, uh, and I'll always be open. You can call really anytime. Steve Archman, thank you so much for coming to the Star Tribune. Okay, thanks for having me. Yeah.